Chapter 9, 594 Holes About 2,500 miles southwest of Hawaii sat a lonely little island called Nauru. The world might have left it alone were it not for what lay under the feet of the grass-skirted natives, phosphate, a central ingredient in aramids. Japan slammed onto Nauru in 1942, violently enslaving the locals to mine phosphate and build a runway. By spring of 1943, the runway was ready, making Nauru an ideal base from which the Japanese could launch airstrikes. On April 17th, Louis' crew and 22 others were ordered to fly to Funafuti Atoll, the launch point for a strike against Nauru. The pre-mission briefing alarmed Louis. They bombed from only 8,000 feet. That week, they practiced bombing from that altitude, and the potential of ground fire to butcher them had worried him. Stanley Pillsbury was spooked by another piece of news. There were about a dozen Zero fighter planes defending Nauru. Zeros had a deservedly fearsome reputation. The prospect of 12 of them scared Pillsbury to death. The next morning, the men walked to Superman. At 5 a.m., they were airborne. The planes took six and a half hours to reach Nauru. No one spoke. Superman led the massive bombers, flying with a plane on each wing. The sun rose and the planes flew into a clear morning. The Japanese would see them coming. Navigator Mitchell broke the silence. They'd be over the island in 15 minutes. In the greenhouse, Louis shivered. Superman was the first plane to cross over Nauru. The air was eerily still. Louis' first target, a collection of planes and buildings, appeared below. Louis began lining up on the gleaming planes. Then, shattering, the sky became a fury of color, sound, and motion as the Japanese guns skyward. Metal flew everywhere, streaking up from below and raining down from above. Something struck the bomber to Superman's left. The plane sank as if drowning. Then the plane to the right fell away. Pillsbury could see the men inside, and his mind briefly registered that they were probably about to die. Superman was alone. Louis kept his focus below, trying to aim for the parked planes. There was a tremendous bang and a terrified shudder. A dinner table-sized chunk of Superman's right rudder blew off. Louis lost the target. While he tried to find it, the plane rocked as a shell bit a wide hole in the bomb bay. At last, Louis had his aim and the first bomb spun into their targets. Then Louis lined up on a barracks in a gun battery and watched the bombs crunch in. He had one bomb left to use as he chose. He spotted a shack. The bomb fell and Louis yelled, bombs away, and turned the valve to close the bomb doors. There was a pulse of dazzling light. Louis had made a lucky guess and a perfect drop. The shack was a fuel depot and he'd struck it dead center. A giant orb of fire billowed upward. Phil and Cuppernell pushed Superman full throttle for home. Zeros were suddenly all around, spewing bullets and cannon shells that exploded on contact. They flew at the bombs, heads on, and cannons firing, slicing between planes, so close Louis could see the pilots' faces. The Zeros were ravaging Superman. In every part of the plane, the sea and sky were visible through gashes in the bomber's skin. Every moment, the holes multiplied. The plane was gravely wounded, trying to fly up and over onto its back. The pilots needed all their strength to hold it level. In the greenhouse, Louis saw a Zero dive at Superman's nose. Nose gunner Mitchell and the Zero pilot fired simultaneously. Louis felt bullets slashing around him, one just missing his face. Then, as the plane sped toward a head-on collision, the Zero pilot jerked. Mitchell had hit him. For a moment, the Zero continued directly at Superman. Then the stricken pilot collapsed onto the yoke, forcing the Zero down under the bomber before crushing into the ocean. Superman trembled on. They were still two Zeros circling it. In the top turret facing backward, Pillsbury had twin machine guns that could take down a Zero, but the Zeros were below, where he couldn't hit them. Feeling a zero's rounds thumping into Superman's belly, he thought, if he'd just come up, I could knock him down. He waited. The plane groaned and shook. The gunners fired, and still he waited. 
Then he heard an ear splitting kabang, 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 and felt a sensation of everything tipping and blowing apart in excruciating pain. A zero had sprayed the entire right side of Superman with cannon shells. The first rounds hit the tail, spinning the plane onto its side. Shrapnel tore into the leg of tail gunner Lambert, who hung on as Superman rolled. The plane's twist saved him. A cannon round struck the spot where his head had been an instant earlier, exploding so close his goggles shattered. Ahead, Shrapnel dropped Brooks and Douglas at the waist guns and Glassman in the belly turret. Finally, a shell blew out of the wall of the top turret, shooting metal into Pillsbury's leg. Superman reeled crazily on its side and for a moment spiraled out of control. Phil and Cuppernell wrenched it level. Clinging to his gun as shrapnel stuck, struck his leg and the plane spun, Pillsbury shouted the only word that came to mind. Ow. Louis heard a scream. When he ran from the nose, the first thing he saw was Harry Brooks lying on the Bombay catwalk, his torso bloody. The Bombay doors were wide open and Brooks was dangling partly off the catwalk, one hand gripping the catwalk and one leg swinging in the air. He reached toward Louis, a plaintive expression on his face. Louis grabbed Brooks and pulled him off the catwalk. He could see holes dotting Brooks's jacket. There was blood in his hair. Louis dragged Brooks into a corner. Brooks passed out. Louis returned to the Bombay. He remembered turning the valve to close the doors and couldn't understand why they were open. Then he saw it. A slash on the wall, purple liquid splattered everywhere. The hydraulic fluid lines, which controlled the doors, had been severed. With the lines broken, Phil would have no hydraulic control of the landing gear or flaps, which he'd need to slow the plane on landing. And without hydraulics, they had no brakes. Louis cranked the Bombay door shut, then looked to the rear. Douglas and Lambert, both bloody, were pawing along the floor, trying to reach their guns. Louis shouted to the cockpit for help. Phil yelled back that he was losing control of the plane and needed Cuperno. Louis said it was an emergency. Phil braced himself at the controls, and Cuperno got up, saw the men in back, and ran to them. Louis knelt beside Brooks. Feeling through the gunner's hair, he found two holes in his skull. There were four large wounds in his back. Louis strapped an oxygen mask to Brooks's face and bandaged his head. He thought about the plane. The gunners were wounded, the plane was shot to hell, and there were still two zeros near. One more pass, he thought, will put us down. Louis felt something drip on his shoulder. He glanced up and saw Pillsbury in the top turret, blood streaming from his leg. Looking absolutely livid, he was gripping the gun and sweeping his eyes around the sky. His leg dangled below him, his pants shredded and boot blasted. Next to him was a large, jagged hole in the side of the plane. Louis tried to doctor Pillsbury's wounds. Pillsbury ignored him. He knew that the zero had hit them would return to finish the kill, and he had to find it. Suddenly, there was a whoosh of upward motion, a gray shining plane, a red circle. Pillsbury shouted something unintelligible, and Louis let go of his foot just as Pillsbury whirled his turret around to face the zero. The Zero sped directly toward Superman. Pillsbury was terrified. With a flick of the Zero's pilot finger on the cannon trigger, Superman would carry the men into the Pacific. Pillsbury could see the pilot who would end his life, the sun illuminating his face, a white scarf coiled about his neck. Pillsbury thought, I have to kill this man. Pillsbury sucked in a sharp breath and fired. He watched the tracers skim away from his gun and punch through the Zero's cockpit. The windshield blew apart and the pilot pitched forward. The Zero faltered like a wounded bird and fell from the sky. The last Zero came up, then dropped. Clarence Douglas, with his thigh, chest, and shoulder torn open, had risen to his gun and brought the plane down. Pillsbury slid into Louis's arms. Louis laid him beside Brooks and eased his boot off. Pillsbury screamed in pain. His left big toe was gone. The toe next to it hung by a string of skin, and portions of his other toes were missing. His lower leg bristled with shrapnel. Louis bandaged Pillsbury, gave him morphine, then hurried away to see if they could save the plane. Superman was dying. Its control cables were cut, one rudder was ruined, fuel was trickling onto the floor, and hydraulic fluid was sloshing in the bomb bay. Phil couldn't turn it without the, with the normal controls, and the plane was pulling upward extremely hard, trying to flip. It was on the verge of stalling, and it was porpoising up and down. 
Phil did what he could. Slowing the engines on one side forced the plane to turn. Pushing the plane to high speeds eased the porpoising and reduced the risk of stalling. By putting both feet on the yoke and pushing as hard as he could, he could stop the plane from flipping. Funafuti was five hours away. If Superman could carry them that far, they'd have to land without hydraulic control of the landing gear, flaps, or brakes. They could work the gear and flaps with hand pumps, but there was no manual alternative to hydraulic brakes. Brakeless, coming in fast, they might need 10,000 feet to stop. Funafuti's runway was 6,660 feet long. At its end were rocks and sea. Louis had an idea. What if they tied parachutes to the plane, pitched them out the windows at touchdown, and pulled the rip cords? No one had ever tried to stop a bomber this way, but it was all they had. They decided to try. Hours passed. Superman shook and struggled. Brooks gurgled blood. Pillsbury couldn't bear the sound. Brooks opened his eyes and whispered. Louis put his ear near Brooks's lips but couldn't understand him. Brooks drifted off. They all knew they'd probably crash on landing, if not before. No one spoke of it. At last, Funafuti appeared. Phil began dropping the plane. They had to slow down. Someone cr- cranked open the bomb bay doors and the plane, dragging on the air, began to slow. Douglas went to the landing gear pump. He needed two hands, one to push a valve and one to work the pump, but he had only one working arm. Pillsbury couldn't stand, but by stretching, he reached the valve. Together, they got the gear down. Mitchell and Louie pumped the flaps down, and Louie and Douglas placed a parachute in each waist window and tied them to the gun mounts. Louie stood between the windows, holding the rip cords. Superman sank towards Funafuti. Pillsbury looked at the airspeed gauge. It read 110 miles per hour. For a plane without brakes, it was much too fast. For a moment, the landing was perfect, the wheels just kissing the runway. Then came a violent gouging sensation. The left tire had been hit and was flat. The plane caught hard and careened left towards two bombers. More out of habit than hope, Cubernell stomped on the right brake. There was just enough hydraulic fluid left to save them. Superman spun around and stopped, barely missing the bombers. Louis was still gripping the parachute cords. He hadn't had to use them. In seconds, the plane was swarming with Marines, rushing the injured out. Louis jumped down and surveyed his ruined plane. All the bombers had returned. Everyone shot up, but none as badly as Superman. Later, ground crewmen would count its holes, 594. That evening, Pillsbury was lying in a barracks, awaiting treatment, when a doctor came in and asked if he knew Harry Brooks. Pillsbury said yes. He didn't make it, the doctor said. Harold Brooks died days before his 23rd birthday. His fiance, Jeanette, learned that he was gone nine days before the wedding date she and Harry had set before he left for the war.